So first of all, you know, I'll note that Dijkstra's algorithm, like for many of the many of the problems we did for BFS, uh, right? Like you could definitely you, you could definitely imagine just those same problems, but with weighted edges. And in some cases, you know, you'd have to use Dijkstra's algorithm. Like if you remember the problem we did uh, last time with you know, you know with BFS about finding the shortest path for two pairs of sources and destinations. Uh, you could ask that same question for weighted graphs, and then the solution would involve Dijkstra's algorithm. So certainly, you can already kind of find uses for Dijkstra's algorithm just out of existing problems that you now make a weighted weighted version of. Uh, however, you know I want to show you some new problems, of course. Uh, so, okay, so here's the first problem. Uh, so this one is, it turns out this one looks hard. I mean, it turns out to be pretty easy. Uh, We'll see that it's not terribly complex. So the idea is, you know, you have uh, two-dimensional space, and you know, you have certain points on that space. Um, and you, you, you know, you, there, there's some point where you start, like maybe your starting point is here. And your goal is to basically uh, reach, like, the, reach the other. Uh, you know, reach some goal point over here. So this is like your destination. And these X's, like basically think of think of this space as kind of being like a puddle or a river or whatever you have to cross. And these X's represent like uh, basically little stepping stones. So these are like little stepping stones. Uh, you know, conceptually, uh, for simplicity in this problem, we see them as just being like, you know, having an exact position. Uh, you know, they're kind of like very small, so they can be seen as points. Uh, and so you're crossing this river, and you know, you start you start on the edge here, and you need to get to some other point here. And on the way there, you have like these little stepping stones that you can step on. Uh, except the caveat is that every stepping stone has a chance that it will sink. So uh, basically, for every stepping stone, there's an associated probability. Between zero and one, saying saying that like you know this is the probability that that this stepping stone will not sink, or you know sink is one minus the other. Uh, so you know for example maybe this stone has like an eighty percent probability of holding up, uh, and this stone has an eighty percent probability, but maybe this one only has a fifty percent probability. So you want to think twice before you sink that one. Uh, and the and then what's given in this problem is you know you're given some distance parameter d, so you're given the locations of all the stepping stones and their associated probabilities. Then you're given some parameter d that represents like you know how far it can jump to get from one stone to the other. Uh, and so basically this is like a radius. You know let's call it r. It's a radius. So basically if you're at this stone, you might have like a certain jump radius. If you are like right here, so uh, and the radius is fixed. It's the same like no matter, no matter where you are. It also applies to your starting point. Your starting point can be seen as a stone with probability one. That's fine. So uh, and your destination is also like a stone with probability one essentially. Uh, so you're given you know all of these positions, start destination, and all the intermediate stones. All the intermediate stones have some probability of sinking that you're also given with each stone, and you're given a parameter r that represents how far you can jump. When you're on a given stone, you can jump to anything that is within r of you. So, for example, if you're here, you could choose to jump here, or you could choose to jump here, but this one is too far. So, and, and now your goal is basically to get from the start to destination via some path. For example, you know, something like this. Uh, in a way that, that maximizes your probability of success. So you want to find the highest possible probability that you will be successful in getting from start to destination via some path. How do you compute like, yeah, so first of all, we have to deal with the problem of essentially building the graph, right? So basically, if we want to know, like, for every vertex, we want to know which which uh, points are in range, 
right? Which other, which for each stone, which other stones can we jump to? So we're not going to focus on really on that subproblem. I mean, of course, okay, what's the scenario you could do it in n squared time, right? For every point, examine every other point, and you know, put the one, put the ones that you can jump to in your adjacency list. Uh, but you know, uh, under some assumptions that these are like relatively uniformly distributed or something like that, you know, you can see some strategy where you know you do some kind of bucketing or something like you know, uh, here are some points. You can kind of come up with this idea that maybe what I should do, you know, they're not like uniformly distributed per se, but they're like, you know, they're not like pathologically distributed. Uh, you know, I could come up with some idea that I want to like overlay some grid mesh over over this, where like if you know, and, and this mesh should be roughly of size r, like these like size of a square should be of size r. And you know, the idea would the, the idea would be that I know that if uh, basically, I would hash each point to what bucket it's in. I can I can hash each point to what bucket it's in, and then for each point in inside a bucket, I know I only like if I'm right here, I know only that I need to check things inside the same bucket and the neighboring bucket. Uh, you know, and the reason I need to check the neighboring buckets is because, of course, within a particular bucket, a point can be right at the edge of it, right? So it could be that it connects to some point that is in the next bucket. But if the buckets are roughly of size r, that basically means that for every point, I will only check its own bucket and the neighboring ones. Uh, and so based on this, like you could cut, you could get something that's a lot more uh, proportional to just the number of edges that will be ultimately in the graph. You know, assuming that the points are not like particularly pathologically distributed, like with everything being concentrated over here. Uh, you know, you could, you could, uh, uh, you know, construct the edges of this graph. You could construct the adjacency list representation in time, in, a, in an amount of time that is, uh, you know, more proportional to just how many total edges there will be, rather than like n squared, where you have to like check every point with every other point. Uh, but that, you know, that aspect of the problem, I don't really want to concentrate on it, because uh, you know, the discussion is about dexterous algorithm, right? So. Uh, suppose you did find the adjacency list representation, and by the way, what would the weights here be? Because it kind of seems like weights are associated with the vertices, right? Well, this is not really a limitation at all. Uh, you know, I think in some earlier session I basically said that the reason we consider most graph algorithms with the weights on the edges is because if you have the weights on the vertices, that's just like a special case of the same thing. Uh, basically, having a weight on the vertices uh, basically means like this weight doesn't depend on which vertex I'm coming from. So you, you can basically transfer whatever weight you have on the vertex to all to the inbound edges of that vertex. In other words, if I have something like this, uh, you know, if I, if I if I have this and I have a weight of you know two four or sorry, I mean if I have the weights on the vertices, like let's say I have. Uh, you know, let's say I have a weight of five, two, three here. Uh, that like, and, and this, is, and the way I'm asking, the way I'm uh, assessing the cost of my shortest path is by counting the weight when I visit the vertex. What I can do instead is I can just transfer this weight onto the inbound edges. So, for example, this three I can transfer onto both of the inbound edges, and that way, just like when I traverse to the vertex, I pay the cost I should have paid when I reached the vertex, and that's equivalent. Like it doesn't matter if I pay this cost as I'm going from C to D or at D, essentially, because in one step I go from C to D, right? And so it doesn't matter where I count this cost. Um, the reason this is actually a special case is because the case of having weights on edges allows you to vary this weight. Like these threes don't have to be the same, right? You can have a different weight coming from B to D than coming from C to D. But the vertex is just a special case where all of the inbound edges of a vertex will have that weight. The, like the, you know, the C to D edge and the B to D edge will have the same weight. Because you're basically just paying the cost of the D vertex. All right. So. Yeah, and, and, and if A had a weight here, then, you know, well, you might have to, depending on the, how the problem is phrased, you might have to add it to the cost, the initial cost of your solution. But, 
other than that, like because there's no inbound edges into A, I don't have to consider the way today. Man, this wind is loud. Gotta rain outside. Alright. So anyway, uh, coming back to this. Um, Yes, yeah, so, so you, you can see that if I manage to build a, a graph here, I can build a graph where every every, every vertex, so obviously it's going to be undirected, right, because the, the connectivity is symmetric. If, you, if I can get from A to B, then I can get from B to A. Uh, so uh, it's going to be an undirected graph that I model this with. Um, and and uh, the relationship that I'm going to model, you know, the entities I model are the positions. And the relationship that I model is whether you, you whether the two positions can be you know led to from one to another. You know, can I, like, like these two have an edge because I can I can lead from this stone to this stone. So I will construct a graph, but now we're not yet ready to apply the extra algorithm, right? We're going to get some graph like you know this doesn't correspond to the drawing, but you know you get some graph like this, uh, and you have some source here, and you have some destination here, and. You know, I can I can put uh, I can basically put uh, well actually I, I guess I do have to construct it as a directed graph just because you know I have to transfer the weight onto the correct edge. So basically, uh, for e for every edge I would have, I'll do I'll do one in each direction. Like if this stone had a probability of 0.7 and this stone had a probability of 0.5, uh, then I will put 0.7 on this edge and 0.5 on this edge. Because because if you ever you know if you're ever already here and you jump to this stone you have a 50 percent you know you have a 50 percent chance of surviving whereas if you're here and you go to this stone you have a 70 percent chance of surviving. Uh, so so you know if this one is if if this one had weight 0.5 and this one had weight 0.7 I have to model it as some situation like that. So for all of these you know I'll model it like this and I'll assign I'll, I'll assign some weight to it. You know, I'll assign some weight to all of these edges, and now it kind of seems more like a shortest path problem of some kind. Uh, except there's still a problem, right? Which is that you know, on my sum, my weights are not additive, right? I can't just go ahead and apply the extra algorithm here because all of these are probabilities between zero and one. And what does the extra algorithm find? It finds the shortest path, which has no relationship here, right? Or like not, not directly. In, uh, I can't just say it's whatever has the lowest sum because that's well. First of all, it's not even true, right? Because uh, at the very least, I'd have to calculate like one minus these. But even if this was like a probability, even if the weight on the edge was a probability of sinking rather than a probability of surviving, it still doesn't really work because uh, like there's no reason to suppose that whatever has the minimum total sum of sinking it has the same product. Which is what I'm really interested in, right? So what, what would be like the probability that I would sink going between the source and the destination? It's going to be the product of the survival uh, probabilities, right? Because each, basically, each uh, attempt to survive is uh, independent, right? Like if this stone is 0.6 uh, over here, then I have like some edge inbound here. At 0.6, that represents an independent probability of survival, and so if I travel along this route, my percent chance of surviving is like 0.42 percent, or sorry, not 0.42 percent, but 0.42, 42 percent. Uh, and what I'm trying to find is basically what is the path to the destination that has the greatest product, right? Because I want to maximize my chance of survival. Um, so one way to do it, there's two ways you can approach this. One is like a really easy way that you're going to see in a moment. But first, I kind of want to give like a hard way. Like you might realize that like the same idea that we have for dexterous, even if dexterous doesn't work, the same idea that we have for dexterous works. Because what we can do is we can we can instead uh, remember the core idea of dexterous was for every vertex. Uh, you know, start at the source vertex and give it some initial value, so the dexterous algorithm is zero, right? Now, find the next lowest cost vertex from, you know, out, out of the ones that have not been, out of the ones to which the shortest path has not yet been computed, 
right? Dijkstra's algorithm first starts at the source vertex, and then it finds the next shortest path vertex, and then it finds it expands that by one more vertex, and it finds a, the next shortest path vertex after that. And basically, every stage is identifying one additional vertex to which we now, now know the shortest path. That's that, that's what Dijkstra's algorithm is doing. Like at any given time, given the neighbors that we given the the shortest paths of the vertices we already know to essentially examine the neighbors to find which neighbor has the next shortest path to it from A. Uh, so, but we can do the same thing here, except we just have to adjust our thinking to say that, okay, we start with a, with a survival probability of one, right? We start, with, we start with a survival probability of one. And now I would like to find the next most, you know, the, the, the node to which I will have the next highest chance of surviving. So the highest chance I have of surviving is at this node, before I've made any moves. It's one. Now I'd like to find the next highest chance of surviving. So essentially, like, chance of not surviving is kind of like, you know, a, kind of like a penalty, right? A cost. Uh, but I want to find the, the node to which I'm going to have the next highest chance of surviving. Uh, and so let's say this one is, so I have two outbound edges. Let's say this one is 0 0.7. And this node, let's say it's 0 0.9. So I have a 0.9 edge here. So the next highest chance of surviving is actually here. So I would basically go ahead and you know visit this node, and I would visit this node, and I would say, okay, this one was visited and gave me a 0.9 chance of surviving, and that is the best chance of surviving I can get to this node by kind of like the same argument that like it has to be the next highest chance of surviving has to be either at this node or at this node, because if it's at any other node then I would say, well, how did you get to this other node? You had to get to an intermediate node, right? At which you would have had a higher chance of surviving. So the same uh, like proof of correctness for Dijkstra's algorithm applies to this argument. And now you would again have a candidate set where I say, okay, you know, so my candidates, I have a 0.7 chance of surviving here. With the, uh, this is some node B. So B has a 0.7 chance node of surviving from A. And then I have a 0.9 chance of surviving at this node C that I visited. Well, okay, this is not in the candidates. This is in the like this is in the distance map. I basically have like one is A and 0.9 is, or you know, I'll put it in this format. A is to one and C is the 0.9. Uh, so this is the ones to which where the survival probability is known. And th these are the candidates, so I have this one, and then I would also have like some candidate here. And let's say this one was, uh, you know, let's say this one is uh, point, point 0.6. So then uh, here I would take the, my chance of probability, my chance of survival up to this point is point 0.9. And then I would take point 0.9 multiplied by point 0.6, and that means the chance of survival here, if I come here from this vertex, will be point 0.54. And so I would record that as a candidate. Like, you know, 0.54, I came from C, and, you know, let, let's say this vertex name is D. So I would end up with something like that. And this runs the same way as the extra algorithm, except, you know, in the extra algorithm, the costs keep increasing, right? We have this global time that keeps increasing. And here, it's kind of the other way around. We have a probability, and that probability keeps decreasing. And we find the next highest probability, and then we drop the probability a little bit more. Uh, and so we, you know, proceed, and you know, okay, the next node selected here will be will be this one, which will be at 0.7. Uh, and and so like this will just continue running like the same way as the extra algorithm does, except the difference is instead of adding weights, you are like multiplying the weight with the, you know, if you have a weight of 0.6, you multiply that with the weight of whatever vertex you're coming from, and then that is the candidate that you have 0.54, and then instead of taking the lowest one, you want to find Greatest one at any given time. You're using max. Yeah, exactly. So instead of using like a min heap, like instead of using a min priority queue, okay, you're using a max priority queue. Right. Exactly. Or you know, insert the negative of these numbers into a priority queue. You know, into a min queue. This is the equivalent, right? Okay. Uh, so that's kind of the hard way to do it. In the sense that, in the sense that you can just understand that these are the same ideas and you can remap it into this, in this way. But there's actually a more direct way. There's a way we can immediately convert this into like a textbook instance of Dijkstra's algorithm. And this one is harder to see, but when you see it, it's like obviously this is like the preferred way. So we can just convert this into a standard instance 
of a problem where the thing that we're asking to do is just minimize a sum of edge weights. And then we can just apply the, the, you know, the algorithm out of the box. Uh, so the way to do this is to recognize that what we're being asked to minimize is basically some product, right, of edge from S to some, you know, let E of, like, let E of uh, X and Y basically mean, like, the cost, the value of the edge between X and Y, right? So we're basically asked to, be, to minimize this product. I1 and I2 and so on are intermediate nodes. And then dot, 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 you know, some I, you know, some N here, and then destination. Right? We are being asked to minimize this, or, sorry, not minimize, maximize, actually. We're being asked to maximize this product. Right? Now, here's the thing. Maximizing a quantity is the same as maximizing as the, as the log of that quantity. The logarithm. Now, why is this relevant? Well, you're about to see. Uh, this is why I say, like, like, like for people who, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know if this is like easy for everybody to see why, why you would ever get that idea of adding logarithms here. Uh, for like more mathy people, I think this is easy to see. Uh, because if we, if we now say that we can instead maximize this, right, because log is an increasing function. If you increase the log, you increase the quantity itself. So saying that you want to maximize that is the same as saying you want to maximize this, the log of everything in this. Ah, but logs have this nice property. Log, log of a times b is log of a plus log a plus log b. So now that means we can just separate them in a sum. And we're just going to have, uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to be asking just to, just about this. I and d. So now we are still asking, like, like this is the same expression, and we are asking, okay, can you go ahead and maximize this sum of logs? But, or, I forgot to write the edge. Yeah, edge. Edge. So now that basically means we can go ahead, and for each, for each of these edge values, we can compute its log. So like whatever we had initially assigned to the edges, like point, 0.9.6, we're just going to go ahead and take its log. <coughs> and that's going to be the value here. So now, after we've, we've replaced each, each edge with its log, now, we, now we, you know, what, what we can do is we can just drop the logs, right? Uh, after we've replaced each edge here with its log, we can drop the logs here, and we can just say that we want to maximize uh, just this sum. Now, you might say, you know, so essentially we want to maximize a sum of connected edges. Oh, look, that sounds like the shortest path, except one thing, right? What's, what's the one thing we don't have going for us yet? Well, maximize, right? So the shortest path minimizes the sum of edges, right? Uh, this is going to maximize it. But this is actually not a problem, because, uh, so, so if you think about it, what like, what do the weights of these edges look like? Uh, like, are they positive or are they negative? Because we took logs of a quantity that was between 0 and 1 in here, right? <clears throat> so if you take the log of something that is between 0 and 1, that's a negative quantity. So actually, all of these edges have negative weight. So we have a graph full of negative weights, and we're asking to maximize a sum. But if you think about it, maximizing some, a bunch of negative numbers is the same thing as minimizing those, uh, like all the numbers in, with the sign inverted. So, because think about it, like if all the numbers are negative, what does it mean to maximize something? It means you found the ones with the least absolute values when adding them up, right? Because, because if, you know, you have like, uh, like just to see on that small example. Like if all of these were actually negative, uh, 
uh, so let's say I have this. Like when I say I want to maximize the path here, what am I what am I really looking for? I'm actually looking for uh, what will maximize it is the things that have like the smallest that are as close to zero as possible, right? The things that are actually have small absolute values. So essentially, that's the same as saying you want to minimize the shortest path here, and that's all for the better here actually because. Uh, what do you know? Uh, Dijkstra's algorithm doesn't even work for negative numbers, right? But now, we actually were guaranteeing that all the edges here are zero or negative after a log transformation. Then, after flipping the negative sign, that means they will all be zero or now positive. So that's great. That means that after this transformation, so the transformation is going to be take the log of this number and then multiply it by negative one. And then we have a positive weight It'll, and now we can say minimize this positive weight, and that is just a, a textbook application of Dijkstra's. So, see, we basically pre process the graph in, in, in such a way that now we can just apply Dijkstra's. And this is maybe not like easy to see. So, like, there's yeah, there's two paths to this problem. Either you have like this insight that's kind of like a little mathy, and you understand you know how like you can transform multiplication into addition and stuff like that. Um, or, you know, you can go the harder route, which kind of involves a deep understanding of Dijkstra's algorithm, but you can see that the same arguments work, and you can just run Dijkstra's algorithm. Like, instead of pre-processing the graph, you can run it directly on the graph in the way I showed earlier. This one was from some, like, uh, coding contest I did, or I, I didn't really do it, I just looked at, looked at its problems. Uh, and, you know, for some reason they decided, the, you know, contest centers decided to make this, like, kind of like, all the problems were, like, Game of Thrones themed for people who, you know, are fans of Game of, Game of Thrones. Uh, and so in this one, I mean, obviously all the, like, storylines for all the problems are pretty contrived, but okay, so, uh, you know, in Game of Thrones there's this character, uh, Varys, right, Spymaster Varys, who, uh, well, you know, among other things, he, he's kind of like, well, he's a spy master who works for the kingdom, and like, among other things, uh, he's known for uh, using little children as informants. Uh, you know, just getting little children to spy on people because nobody expects it. Uh, but anyway, so in this problem, there is a bunch of cities, so these are going to be modeled as, you know, nodes. So there's a bunch of cities, and there's a bunch of roads, for, um, you know, for intents and purposes, let's say that uh, the roads are unidirectional, and of course there can be, you know, uh, a road in each direction, but there's a bunch of unidirectional roads between cities. And one of these nodes is basically this kind of like destination node, uh, call it K, for like King's Landing, which is the city where Varys lives. Uh, it's like the capital, basically. Um, and, you know, there's some, like these may be connected up in like, various ways. And, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and so there's like this, uh, you know, there's a bunch of cities and there's a bunch of unidirectional road networks between, oh, there's a bunch of unidirectional roads between the cities, of course, some, some pairs of cities may have roads leading back and forth between them. And every road, uh, or rather, no, not every road, but every city has basically a safety rating, which is like, like basically how, how safe that city feels to be. So, you know, uh, maybe, uh, like, maybe King's Landing, you know, has like a, or let's say like high, high ratings are basically means the city is safe, uh, and, you know, they can be used to basically say that this city is safer than this city. Uh, so, you know, maybe this city is like 10, and, you know, this city is, uh, you know, maybe this city is pretty safe, it's 30, uh, and this city is pretty unsafe. Five and uh, you know five, ten. Yeah, this one's twenty. Okay. So, well, okay. Let's let this one be like eight or something. So it's less safe than this one. And yeah, let's say you can go here too. And 
the idea is there's, uh, you know, Veris has some informant. The, you know, the, uh, uh, the problem description didn't say if it was a small channel, but it, it's probably a small channel. Um, you know, so, so Veris has like some small informant, uh, some, some informant, uh, that he wants to get the informant to come to King's Landing. However, you know, th this informant is kind of like running away from something, and is kind of panicking, and basically this informant just keeps moving, and at any given time, uh, their strategy is going to be, be to move to the next city, is going to be to, to move to one of the adjacent cities, specifically the one that is safest. So, uh, for example, let's say the starting location, of, you're given the starting location of the informant, and you have this goal, you know, you have this, your goals here, and the informant will start at vertex A, and then at any given time they will go to the safest city. So, for example, uh, the, uh, so, so in this example, the informant will choose to go here because this city is safest. Uh, and then they make the same choice all over again locally. So, for example, here D actually has a road to E, but E has safety rating eight. Uh, but A has safety rating ten, so the informant here would actually go back to A. And then having reached A, by the same logic, the informant would go back to D and go back to A forever. So the informant will keep forever moving between these two cities in this example. Now, uh, Ferris, uh, you know, he has a lot of influence and he wants to make sure the informant reaches him. Uh, and to do this, he, proposed, he has this idea that he's going to close some number of roads. He's going to essentially cut some edges from this graph to uh, basically force the informant into such a path that they end up at King's Landing. Uh, you know, following the rule that the informant always goes to the safest city that they're able to. But if, for example, this, city, this edge is cut off, right, then now the informant will, well, okay, you know, for simplicity, you assume that all of these are, have unique numbers. Uh, now, the, now this would actually push the informant to go here instead, right? The informant would now decide to go here after this edge has been cut. And, but, but you know, cutting roads is really expensive. Uh, like, you, you know, Veris doesn't want to have to close a lot of roads, right? Because it, you know, uh, affects the kingdom's commerce or whatever. Uh, so, uh, Veris wants to know, like, what is the minimum number of roads he can close uh, such that the informant will at some point reach him after, you know, going around in loops for a while, maybe. Or, or you know, not, not in loops, but after going around for a while. The, he, Veris just wants it to, it to be that the informant eventually reaches the King's Landing mark. Like, here it doesn't, right? Like, if you don't cut any roads, you, you, the informant goes from A to D and back from D to A, and then you back and forth forever. But if you cut this, let's see what happens. If you cut this, the informant now goes here. Well, now once now, now once again, the informant would go back to D, and then from D back to A. Like if you don't do anything about it, uh, you, you know now we have this path. So after you know after this one is cut, this like red one is cut, right? Uh, now, now you still have this trajectory where C goes here, uh, and you know this has a safety rating of twenty, but that's not as good as the safety rating of thirty. So the informant will still go here, and then the informant will still go along this line. And once again, you know you're stuck with the informant not going to the King's Landing, right? So you know Veris has some options of like what to do. Oh, let's say like this edge doesn't exist. So here maybe Veris could choose to also cut this edge, right? And after this edge here is also cut, uh, the informant will now go here. You know, so this one is still alive, but now it's not being taken. And now there's no path to the city, so the informant goes here. And then uh, this King's Landing is actually safer than this, so the informant goes here. And so after cutting two edges from the graph, uh, Varus can force the, infor uh, the informer to travel the King's Landing. And so the question was basically, uh, what is the, like, you know, find the minimal edges that need to be removed from the graph for this to happen. So this uh, uh, kind of doesn't look easy, right? But it, uh, it actually has a very simple solution. Uh, it doesn't look easy because uh, what, uh, like, it, it kind of seems like, okay, you have to try 
removing various subsets of edges from the graphs and then from the graph and then when you do that you have to like search and see if there's you know you have to like follow the path and see if there's a path that eventually leads to the vertex or where does the path get stuck in an infinite loop right uh, and other possibilities you don't get stuck in an infinite loop but maybe you end up in a situation like this uh, you know where there's no outbound action out of here or something this is like prison I guess <laughs> <laughs> or something, if there's no outbound edges from it. Uh, so, you know, uh, how do you solve it? Well, it turns out there's a surprisingly easy kind of principle that you can use, and you can tie back to shortest paths with weights on those paths. So, here's the thing. Uh, we can basically just go ahead and label each edge that is taken for free. Like, in other words, each edge that doesn't require bears to remove any rows because it's already the safest choice, we can label it as zero. So here, we, what we can do is we can just say, oh, okay, you, you want to know the cost of these edges? Well, look, uh, the cost of this edge is zero because it's the free one, right? But if you want to go to this edge, like if you ever want to go here from A, you ever want to take this edge, that implies that you've already cut this one. So the cost of it is one. You need one cut before you can ever take this. And what is the cost of this edge? Well, it has cost two. So basically, for every vertex, sort the edges and give the chi give the best one, the one with the safest vertex, cost zero. Give the next one cost one, cost two. And you know, apply that everywhere. So here, there's only one edge, so there's only a cost zero here. Here, there's uh, two edges. You got this one and this one. So uh, this one is free, has cost zero, but this one has cost one, because you need to cut this edge before this one would ever happen. Uh, and here, you know, this one is free, but this one you would need to cut one before it happens. Uh, and here, uh, this one is going to be the free one, but you need to cut one before it happens. And, and that's it. Uh, now solve shortest paths on this, uh, and this actually works, because Essentially, you're putting on each edge, like, like to, for this edge to ever be taken, you must cut an edge. I mean, you, like, you must cut, uh, like here, you know, you got this edge, you must cut this one before this one could ever be taken. Uh, so, in, in, you can you just view it as having cost of one. Like, you just pay it cost of one, and then you can traverse it. And then from there, you can traverse any three edges, like this one. Uh, so, so yeah, that, that's actually all there is to it. Uh, and Dijkstra's algorithm applies, you know, just as fine to zero edges. Like it, it you know, it, it works fine. It's kind of a corner case, but it does work fine. Uh, you know, then they just get processed in the priority queue at like an arbitrary order. All the ones that have the same zero weight, and it, it, it's fine. Uh, it just doesn't work for negative edges. <laughs> Uh, so you can use Dijkstra's here, or uh, or actually, you can even improve this further. Uh, you could even be using uh, BFS here. It's kind of harder to see how you can use BFS uh, because it does appear the way that the edges have weight. But you you basically uh, after like some trickery, you can you can use BFS. Uh, the, the kind of trickery is you can do this kind of transformation. So let's say you have A. Uh, remember, like all my all my edges are always going to have weights that are in this pattern, right? It's always going to be the case that like A has some weight of edge, some edge of weight zero, then some edge of weight one, two, etc., right? So you know, in the Dijkstra's version formulation, I would just kind of formulate my graph like this. But if I wanted to set this up for BFS, what I can do is I can uh, basically I can basically structure it like uh, I can I can have edges that are like this, uh, and then this goes uh, to well these are kind of like W nodes I'm inserting, and then I can have V here, C here, and D here. Except now I will basically do like a somewhat modified version of BFS where I offer I offer two kinds of edges. There are free edges and there are paid edges, and so. And so, you know, this one is a, uh, the, the red ones are basically free, and the uh, blue ones are paid. 
So, but, but, but here, like, there's no weights other than the distinction between what is free and what is uh, what is paid. So you can see that in, you know, to get from A to C, you have to pay cost of one implicitly, right? Because you have to traverse this. Otherwise, you can never get here. Uh, to get to here, you would have to pay a cost of two. You're walking two blue edges. These are the blue ones are the ones that are uh, paid, and the red ones are like the free ones. Um, how does BFS work with free edges? Well, it's basically a BFS where like everything has weight either zero or one. And so what happens is basically when you visit a vertex, you uh, you look for any edges that it has, and you kind of add those. Like you know how in BFS you have like a curved level and you have a past level, right? Or or you have a current level and you have like a next level that, of nodes that you're going to process. So you have you know the current distance you're processing and you have the next distance. Uh, so here it would be that whenever you see these free edges, you have to add them to the current set of distances. So if I'm if I'm if, if this node has distance k from the source and I see a free edge from it, I have to uh, you know I also have to consider vertex b as being distance k uh, instead of it being distance k plus one like this node would be because you have to you know you add a, an edge to the neighbor set. Uh, and then, so this is somewhat more complicated to conceptualize, but like you can you, you can do it. Like BFS can work with this too. You, you have to modify BFS a little bit to make this work. But the advantage of doing that is like that does run in uh, linear time. Uh, you can also do a Dijkstra's based solution of this that runs in linear time too. Now you might be wondering how the, how that is uh, because Dijkstra's runs in e log e. But if you modify Dijkstra's a little, you could actually. Um, you, you can recognize that basically uh, the so the time parameter in Dijkstra's, like the value of the next node that is retrieved, is always increasing, right? So like if right now Dijkstra's algorithm is processing a node at time 30, then the other nodes have a time higher than that, right? Uh, and you can kind of use this to your advantage. You can, you can uh, implement the priority queue differently. You don't have to implement it with like a standard min heap. Instead, you can just have a distinct bucket for every possible weight. This is taking the advantage of the fact that we know that we know that the maximum path to k, we know that the maximum path to the goal can't cost more than e, right? It can't cost more than e, where e is the number of edges in the graph, right? If we ever find ourselves cutting more than e edges, that's not possible. Uh, so we know that the final solution, that we know that all the weights that are ever going to be involved in this are, you know, have values that are between zero and e. Uh, like the total cost to any, from the source to any node is going to be between zero and e. And that means that instead of like setting up a normal priority queue, we could, you know, set up the priority queue as just an array of size e, where in every bucket we are just storing the nodes to process for that bucket. We and, and and then we and then because our uh, you, you know like each of these is associated with like a list of nodes we want to process that are at that distance and this is like this is zero one two three four five etc all the way to e and uh, because in Dijkstra's algorithm the priority queue is what's called monotone it's like always increasing uh, the the next weight is always higher than the last one we processed. Uh, you know, to find the next largest weight, we can just keep a pointer. Like we can have a pointer here, and then we can, and when we're out of stuff in the five bucket, we can just increment the pointer to six and see if there's anything in the six bucket. If not, we just increment it to seven and so on. And therefore, we run through this array like only once. And uh, you know, I don't have time to do the full analysis of that, but if you do, if you analyze that, you will see that it, it actually is linear time. Uh, the reason you can't normally do that in Dijkstra's algorithm is because the running time is uh, the running time of that is actually order e, you know, for the edges of the graph, plus the size of this array. So if you implement it that way, it's order e plus you know size of array. So essentially maximum maximum cost of anything you want to process. So this doesn't work for most graph problems because usually the edge weights can be quite big and the final cost of the distribution can be quite big. But here we know that the max cost is no greater than e. And so we know that if we put in here, it doesn't ruin the asymptotic complexity. And we can actually do a modified version of Dijkstra's to solve this in linear time as well. But these are kind of advanced optimizations. I mean, the, the real picture I want you to see is just this. 
you know, that you can just map this, like, edge cutting problem to just the shortest path problem. And then solve, you know, because it does appear to be a weighted problem, go ahead and solve it using dexterous.